Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Peter Gagan. I work for Heroku, and this is my talk. Uh, it's called Upsert Use Cases. Um, it's talk about a, a new feature in the just released PostgreSQL 9.5. Um, this particular feature has been, I would say, a long time coming. Um, and I'm uh, quite relieved that it was uh, in PostgreSQL 9.5. Um, so let's get started. Um, what is it? What is Upsert? Upsert, incidentally, is my, it's a sort of a, um, portman to update or insert. Uh, it's a way that we casually refer to the feature. Um, so the idea is that you, those of you who don't know, you insert a row or on the basis of um, an existing conflicting version of that row uh, being present, you instead go to update that existing row. Um, Postgres 9.5 also added a similar um, insert ignore type feature that rather than updating would have um, the insert statement, which we'll see the syntax of in a moment, um, not insert anything at all on the basis of there being a, an existing conflicting row. Um, and the big picture here is that you don't have to worry about concurrency. Um, you quite simply uh, write um, the upsert statement and you leave it at that. You don't have to give too much further consideration to race conditions, concurrency. As we'll see, this is um, important. Um, thank you. It alleviates the burden of um, writing what can be um, fairly subtle code. Um, so what, I'm what, what I specifically mean is that there are various errors that may occur in similar features in other systems without you perhaps expecting them to occur um, that we have voided. Um, so sometimes I've used this more formal terminology that I myself invented as jargon, um, the so-called fundamental absurd property. Um, and these are the errors I specifically refer to, what I called unprincipled deadlocks, which means you have two sessions that are upsetting at the same time, and they deadlock with each other, but in a rather unconventional way. Specifically, there's no user visible mutual dependency. You as an end user cannot very well say, oh, I know, I'll just reorder the statements within my transaction, and that'll make that go away. So it wouldn't have done if you simply had to live with deadlocking of that nature, even though you had no such uh, conventional mutual dependency. You know, you didn't have two updates that you could reorder to make them consistent in every transaction. You, because there's two locks involved in this one statement, um, so that doesn't happen, and that's known to happen with other systems, um, which we will have a little bit more on shortly. Um, also, no spurious, unique violations. The whole point of an of an upsert is you insert on basis of that of there being an existing row, by which I specifically mean a uh, row that has the same um, value in a constraint that you specify, uh, then you, you ought to go update or ignore or whatever it is. Uh, but you certainly don't want to have a unique violation in that um, unique constraint or index. That's the, the whole point is that you're avoiding that. If that happens, the feature, in my view, is broken. So that also doesn't happen. Uh, this, uh, this may seem uh, almost obvious that this should not occur, and yet, as we'll see, there are examples from other systems where this, these things do regularly occur um, in the event of concurrency. So the syntax is sort of driven by an insert. I'll show that shortly. Um, like I said, this is a very widely requested feature, mostly for OLTP and web app sort of use cases. Now the syntax. Um, so what, is, what you see here is that I've extended the uh, existing insert statement. I've added a new clause 
that um, makes all this possible. Um, so in fact, yes? I, I, I'm afraid not. There was an, a, uh, an AV guy in and uh, I, actually I think he said, don't turn off the lights during the presentation. So he specifically told me not to. <laughs> uh, um, I think it's being, it's being recorded, that's why. Um, okay, so the syntax you see here, first of all, we have a fairly basic example of an upsert, a conventional example. So here, um, there is an insert of two rows, um, the one that says gizmo translobal, and then another that says associated computing. Um, so this is a uh, simple case where we will either insert um, one or both of those, uh, or zero or, or one or two of those, or update them alternatively um, on the basis of specifically a unique violation in, the, this is probably the primary key. See the way it says on conflict did? That did is the primary key. We're saying that's the constraint we are taking this alternative update path on. The second example is, um, it shows the, what I called before the ignore um, variant, where we're, rather than updating, we're simply doing nothing on the basis of an existing version of that row. We're leaving it as it is. And the third example is a slightly more worked out upstart example where we are inserting uh, or updating one row and we have an additional um, constraint on what we update the row on. We are also, we're also signifying that in order to go ahead with that update, the zip code is not equal to 21201. Um, and if it doesn't pass, the update doesn't go ahead, of course. Um, the, up, the update will it still lock the row with this variant, or with, with upstart rather, which is not true of conventional updates. They won't lock rows that were not affected, because otherwise you'd lock almost every row in the table. Whereas this will, um, this will reliably lock the row in the event of you not updating. Okay. I'm highlighting the um, excluded pseudo table here, and this is a way of us, a way that we can reference rows originally proposed for insertion. So it would be inconvenient and possibly, in, you know, not even uh, possible to repeat the values from the insert because the first one certainly is a multi-row insert. So having the excluded pseudo table allows us to, um, you know, it's, it feels like a join almost on what you originally proposed for insertion. So it's just a convenient way of referencing what you, what you have there in the first place without repeating it. And obviously because this is, as I said, a multi-row insert statement, you know, it would be rather inconvenient to do it any other way. Um, okay. This incidentally does carry forward the effects of before insert triggers, um, which may have contributed to the rows uh, taking the alternative path being excluded from insertion. So update, the update statement in Postgres in general supports an update from where you're joining against, you're joining a target table that you mean to update against another table um, and you are updating one from the other. So it kind of feels like the excluded table, it sort of feels like that in an update except it's implicit that the excluded table is available and obviously it's a special sort of table. A magic uh, implicitly defined table. <coughs> okay, this is, this highlighted um, syntax is the did column is the, um, this is uh, used to infer, as I, as I say, or as we say now, um, the uh, unique index that you are interested in using to arbitrate whether or not you take this alternative update path um, this will figure out what, which of any of the available unique indexes you had in mind. 
um, dealing with various subtleties. Make, makes your intent clear. Um, so specifically what it does is if you happen to get a duplicate violation in any other of the defined unique indexes that you did not infer here, then you will in fact get a conventional duplicate violation. This is a problem with still with the MySQL implementation where you just better make sure that anywhere you get a dupe violation is where you half expected to get one. Um, if, for example, for whatever reason, um, you end up getting uh, a dupe violation in some other um, unique index, then that implementation will, you know, spuriously update, possibly causing something you might describe as logical corruption. Um, so we avoid all that by um, offering this and requiring you to use it, requiring you to be explicit about exactly what you mean to update. Okay. Um, this is much better than naming an index or a constraint directly. It's more robust than that. Um, the columns can be in any order. This can be a composite index, certainly. Um, you could have, you know, you could, you could be um, inconsistent in the ordering, and that would just work fine. Um, there are other um, sorts of advanced um, abilities, which we'll see in a little while. Um, so it's going to figure out uh, which um, of, you know, which unique index you want to use, which, and, and implicitly which ones you don't. Um, these, incidentally, these unique indexes that you infer will appear in explain output if you attempt to explain, or if you go to explain uh, the insert or update statement, then you'll see precisely what actually was inferred and other details like that. Um, so insert um, on conflict do nothing also supports exclusion constraints. Exclusion constraints are sometimes called a generalization of unique constraints. That means that um, they, if, a, if a unique constraint is a constraint that enforces equality, that is that there can be no two equal things in a row or set of rows at the same time, exclusion constraints generalize that to other operators, for example, the overlaps operator. So this could be useful in, um, in a domain like event management. We're in this room right now. We are occupying this room. If we wanted to have not fixed time slots, but time slots over um, continuous ranges, arbitrary, um, you know, arbitrary uh, slices of, of time that things could happen in a room, um, overlaps, an overlaps operator would determine if something overlapped with something else. But by having it, having that represented as an exclusion constraint, we can enforce, much like a unique index, that no one can use the, the room at the same time and have that work in a robust way. And so this will work with the do nothing variant, but um, you may want to spell out the name of the unique constraint yourself directly by using a syntax which I have not shown, um, which is basically on conflict on constraint, constraint name do nothing. Um, okay. Um, one question I get a lot is, why did I not go about implementing merge? Um, for those of you that don't know, merge is a feature in a number of other major database systems. Um, it's described by the SQL standard. It's a DML statement which is often thought to be comparable to what I'm talking about, um, but I would suggest that isn't really the case at all. Um, it's kind of a way of combining a bunch of insert, update, or even delete statements. So you're, you're sort of, it's defined as joining two tables together and, and inserting, update, or, or deleting one of them, a target from source, useful certainly in data warehousing, that kind of thing, where you want to reconcile two tables. 
But importantly, merge, as implemented and as described by the standard, there's no counterexample, um, does not provide guarantees around definitely getting an insert or an update. Um, there's plenty of evidence that people expect this and are often disappointed when in production it doesn't turn out that way. Uh, so I, I was able to add some amount of merge-like flexibility to what I came up with, um, but it's not equivalent to merge. Uh, merge has all of these various problems, and I think on the whole, um, I was happy that um, I was able to offer something that I feel gave, gave, gave people what they really wanted. Um, okay. This is, um, can I get a show of hands? Does anyone recognize what this is? Anyone? Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Visibility is not so good here. Um, okay. What, what you're seeing here, and maybe this will jog some memories when I describe what it is. Uh, yeah, that's pretty bad. Um, yes. Um, it's showing you how you ought to do in previous versions, how you ought to go about correctly implementing more or less what I've described, that you definitely get either an insert or an update. And what you can't see here is that this is like a PL, PGSQL um, function that involves a subtransaction. So initially you attempt an update. In the event of that not affecting any row, you go and insert in a subtransaction, which may itself have a dupe violation, which you can catch in the subtransaction. And if that happens, then you try from the start. So this is pretty ugly, but it does work. It does offer that useful set of guarantees. So this is what you would have been required to do previously. And a lot of people weren't doing this anyway. They were doing other things that um, maybe seemed that like they were safe, but in fact were not. But this would be the safe way of doing it that is correct, according to my own definition, prior to 9.5. It's error prone. Um, you can have problems, for example, with um, getting a unique violation in the wrong unique constraint. I already talked about why I think that's important in general. You could even have, say, a trigger to find on the table that um, ha affects some other table and which may itself raise a duplicate violation. So perhaps the spurious violation isn't even on the same table. There are a number of subtleties like this um, that must not be missed when using this particular approach. OK. So I mentioned just a moment ago how Merge doesn't offer these um, guarantees. I'll now show you how to make Merge do just this, to make it you know, more or less offer these guarantees. Um, and this is, is an example from Stack Overflow. This is an Oracle um, Merge statement. Um, again, this is rather difficult to read here, so I'll tell you what it says. Um, it, it, it's a, an example of someone had a Merge statement and essentially said, why doesn't it do what I just said it ought to do? That is, why, does, why do I sometimes not? I sometimes get a spurious violation, unique violation. I'm, ex I'm not expecting that. Isn't that the point? Um, and someone here proposes a solution that was well received on the Stack Overflow page um, where they do what I showed in the last slide with Postgres. They have a subtransaction they, or a transaction they put the merge in, and they have to, to handle all the errors. They're catching errors there at the bottom um, in that exception block. So, in fact, all they've accomplished over and above what Postgres was doing in earlier versions was to combine an insert and an update into one statement, um, which is really, in the main, not what people are interested in. People are interested in simple guarantees. So I guess this illustrates, in my mind, what the problems are with Merge. Um, it hasn't really, as we see here, it hasn't really saved um, this person any trouble at all. Um, so, in summary, on merge versus upsert, upsert is about guaranteeing a certain outcome, insert or update, uh, whereas merge 
quite a different kind of different uh, thing. It operates according to the same rules as individual insert update or delete statements, just combined together. Um, in order to make upsert have these various guarantees, um, I had to essentially create new um, except exceptions to the rules about how MVCC, a core um, mechanism for um, transaction isolation in Postgres works, I had to suit, to suit the purposes of this statement, I had to create special cases there. Merge does no such thing. Um, so, um, and, and that's sort of what I'm getting at here when I say there's a fundamental difference because it merge doesn't make any guarantees at all. Um, it's good for bulk loading, it's good for data warehousing, uh, when you want to when you want to drive everything to the big join, because it's maybe it's a conventional join. Certainly nothing is required to go through a unique index. In fact, maybe there isn't even a unique index defined on the table. I mean, after all, in data warehousing that could be very common. If you're doing a bulk load before, you might then only create the index afterwards. So quite a different thing. Um, this is a MongoDB bug. Um, now I'm not in the business of bashing MongoDB. Not really my style. And in any case, um, I don't know very much about it, so I wouldn't be very well qualified to do that. Um, but I'm pointing at that, and this bug is current today. I did check it again. So this bug still exists and has been acknowledged by MongoDB as being a valid bug. It concerns a regression in the latest version of MongoDB due to their, presumably due to their wired tiger storage engine having more granular locking than before. So what we see here is people all of a sudden getting um, duplicate violations where you know, they're supposed to not have that happen. That's the point, that you get an update, not a dupe violation. And so this, this is a regression that they have um, which they're, they're working on. MySQL, I think, similarly had problems of this nature um, in, in the past. I believe that those are sorted out now. Um, but I guess I, when I was working on the feature, I looked into problems people were having with other systems with you to avoiding those. Um, so it's rather subtle to, um, to get these details right all at once. Yes. Uh, no, it's not, no. Merge is in the SQL standard. Um, this is the, it tends to be the case that when people, when, 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 when vendors, when implementers implement something like this, they'll use their own flavor of, uh, or their own syntax. Um, so MySQL has its own one. We, we have our own one now. Teradata has its own one. And there's a number of, of, of other, I think, um, is it Sybase? So there's a tendency perhaps because of these sort of subtleties for them to do it, in each case, their own way. Um, so if you had another non-standard syntax, I don't see that the SQL standards committee would, I mean, they don't even, the, the SQL standard doesn't even acknowledge indexes. It doesn't mention indexes because they would consider that to be an implementation detail. Um, and so if they don't mention indexes, you know, it's not, they don't concern themselves with, with you know, not unreasonably, they don't concern themselves with that stuff. So it's kind of thing that they, I think they would never do, basically. Okay. And now a more general summary of upsert. It offers what I would call a very flexible syntax, um, which I'm very happy with. We got all the edge cases, we fixed them. Um, so some of the things I've talked about here have occasionally maybe sounded a bit complicated, but ultimately it's all about guarantees that you as an app developer can leverage, um, making it easy to use correctly, hard to use incorrectly. Um, we may still do merge in the future, I'm not opposed to that. It does have its uses as I've acknowledged. Um, and. Um, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say on merge in general, or on upstart in general. Um, okay, so at this point, I will take any questions on, on upstart in general, if, any, if anyone has them. 
Um, does anyone have any questions about anything I've said so far? Okay. So I'll now discuss um, new use cases, some less obvious uses of the feature. Um, in some cases, using things that are unique to Postgres, um, which I think are notable for data integration. What is, what is data integration for our purposes? Um, it's sort of an, a, a requirement to um, integrate data from diverse sources. Um, these are often autonomous or distributed sources, um, which is to say that we don't control how they might be um, formatted. It might be that a vendor does that and it's not practical, practicable to get them to do it the way we would prefer. Um, so maybe there's inconsistencies across these various sources, that kind of thing. This is very common. Um, this is just the, the way of the world. Um, and how those are represented might be inconsistent too. Maybe, for example, it could be that they're using different um, actual character encoding, but it might also be something like maybe they're using metric units because it's a Canadian or a European supplier, that kind of thing. Um, so these are all inconsistencies we must account for. Um, Maybe this is in something like a comma separated values file or something terrible like that. Um, so these are sort of practical real world um, scenarios. Um, not especially glamorous, but um, I think common. Um, okay. Now in this sort of complicated landscape, um, um, it's important that we have, or sometimes it's important that we have uh, item sentence, which is to say, um, in this case, the upsert statement can be executed multiple times without changing the result beyond the first application. Um, so typically you'll be able to write the upsert statement such that it doesn't especially matter if it's executed multiple times. Um, that's something that can happen from time to time, so that'll be just fine um, if you write the statement correctly. Um, if we need to reconcile the table in a live system, um, I mentioned before special visibility rules, how, how I've changed in very specific cases how MVCC works. Um, that could be necessary here. That could be particularly necessary here because you could have multiple concurrent processes doing this sort of thing. Um, and you can't really sort of fence the tables, make sure nothing is happening from any other process at the same time. That's really not practical. Um, and there's probably all other various messiness, um, as there always is. So my perspective um, here is when you're dealing with all this complexity, um, just be careful is a bad plan. Um, it's certainly not going to scale all too well. Um, ETL is always complicated, but having, you know, meshing all this complexity together um, can be sometimes um, very difficult, very challenging. So by having all these guarantees, you can sort of leverage them to the hilt. We've got a, a few basic good primitives that you can use, and you can, you can get a lot of mileage out of them. And you don't have to be an expert to get all this benefit. And because it's easy, you sort of get it automatically. So I feel this is a very important um, goal um, for, for Postgres in general. Um, so I think I've, um, I've done that here. Um, now, getting a bit more into the example, um, this is something I'm calling an accidental distributed system, which is, uh, it's not something like uh, involving Apache, Kafka, or some, or some kind of message Bus, bus system, something uh, fancy like that. It's a more um, prosaic, more day-to-day -day kind of example. Um, so uh, this particular example involves retail systems with disparate suppliers um, with ad hoc text file formats. 
Um, some of these may sell the same product um, without necessarily being um, all from independent manufacturers. So they could be selling, multiple suppliers could be selling the same products essentially. This is a standard boring sort of business information system. Um, and there, this requires periodic syncing with regional, um, regional suppliers. Um, these are basically autonomous systems. Um, so the end retailer needs to maintain details of each product with autonomous systems um, of not an obvious, you know, it's not obvious that one is authoritative in respect of what values, for example, a product description is. So there's, there's various subtleties because of that. Um, okay, so this is a, an example a little more worked out. I'm creating a products table here, suppliers table, and a supplier prices table. Um, so these suppliers perhaps don't have a particular interest in making this easy for you. After all, they would have you buy everything from them when, for you know, practical reasons, economic reasons, you're not inclined to. Um, okay, so they don't they don't care about um, distinctions that the um, the end user, the retailer, naturally cares about. They're not especially um, inclined to accommodate the requirements that that person may have. Um, so um, we we need to work around that. Okay. So this is an example uh, absurd statement. Um, so what you're seeing here is. We're downloading a new comma separated values file, inserting some rows into a product, um, and then potentially updating, but on the basis of the existing last updated at um, being less than the, the new timestamp that you see there. So it's kind of like your, your update will only go ahead if that data is considered authoritative on the basis of um, on the basis of it being the most recent according to that timestamp. Um, so it's sort of like, to make it more technical, the update sort of has its own snapshot, which is the timestamp that you specify. Maybe that's um, going over people's head. But um, again, the whole point here is that you just, there's semantics it provides. They're not especially complicated although the details of how you might avoid problems are more complicated. You just, you get, you get that um, facility and you use it and you don't have to be an expert. It just works. If you're trying to do it the other way, there's um, significant potential for problems to arise. Okay, all right. Um, so, you know, as I said, if, if, if we make all this easy, if we make it just happen, then even people who are, you know, not liable to it, you just automatically get all these sort of benefits and they, they will accrue, I guess. All right. Um, so you've seen how Upsert can selectively update a row. Um, we'll look at more advanced capabilities now. This is where a lot of the detail work went. Um, your favorite existing feature should work seamlessly. We've, there's a principle in PostgreSQL development that all features must play nice with each other. So um, you'll have a hard time finding any case where we've failed to make the new upsert statement work with an existing feature. Okay, um, so I'm going a little bit back to the example in, in, in making this further point. Um, so consider that you might have a system where products need to be, or other objects that are represented in the database, need to be logically deleted, but not actually deleted. Maybe you have historic sales records that need to continue to refer to the products. You have line items that are sold years in the past. Even though those products have logically been deleted, they still need to be in reports and so on and so forth and yet they don't, you probably don't want to display them when you do a generic search for the product. 
Um, however, you can't very well delete the product um, and expect to, you know, have them in, for first, as a, sorry, excuse me. In the first place, you, you can't delete them because they are simply not going to be available for the report. But it's also true that if you, you that would present a difficulty with um, constraints in that you, um, if you have a flag that represents that the Boolean column is deleted, um, the, there's a difficulty there with um, making sure that um, you still enforce constraints, say, on um, the SKU, the barcode, whatever it is, the supplier code. Um, if you still have the product record, the old product record in the table, it can still happen that you need to create it again because you, know, you need a new representation of that same product for whatever reason. It does happen. So you cannot very well have both records in the same table if you naively have a unique constraint. However, Postgres is a good way of working around this. You could use a partial unique index. You could have it say, you know, create unique index on column where is active. And so when you set is active to false, thus logically deleting the product record, at that point you will, um, you will have then, um, you'll then, it won't matter when you go to create a new version of it because uniqueness will only be enforced among those rows that are currently active. Um, so you get everything works basically. Um, but the question then arises, well, where does this leave upsert? Um, and that too is supported. So this is slightly, I don't know how visible that is. So you see here there's a where is active. That is distinct from a predicate on the update. Notice it's before the update, not after. There could also be a predicate afterwards, there just isn't. Um, so this is saying when we go to look for or infer unique index, it's okay if it only covers those rows where is active. Um, so that partial unique index will work just fine, um, as you would expect, because we spelled that out. Again, this just works. Um, I also already mentioned this uh, phrase I was fond of, making it hard, easy to use correctly and hard to use incorrectly. I think I've accomplished that, or we've accomplished that. Um, it's a little bit unusual that the presence or absence of a constraint affects the semantics of a query, but that just seems to be the way it needs to work. Um, so we sort of bend over backwards to make it safe. Having offered this inference capability, we ought then to make sure that we don't add further ways to shoot yourself in the foot with the inference capability. Um, so having made people use it, we better be very sure that we haven't given them more problems than we've prevented the cure. If the cure was worse than the disease, that would be pretty bad. Um, so there are further edge cases that I'll talk a little bit about. Um, I mentioned earlier you can explain. Well, in general, not everyone realizes you can explain an insert or an update, but indeed you can. This is an example of explaining um, an upsert, um, showing the novel aspects of it. There's, these are highlighted. Um, so you can see the arbiter index. In this case, it's called upsert p key, the primary key. This, of course, is what determines um, whether or not we had a would-be dupe violation, which is grounds for taking the, in the update path. Um, so it's specifically limited to that one here. Um, it is possible sometimes that you would have multiple such equivalent unique indexes. For example, you're doing a migration. Maybe you are replacing an index because it's bloated, something like that. These things do happen. Um, and we, we need to worry about, you know, the, the rare cases a lot because when it does come up, even if it's very rare, it can be very surprising if you, if you have a spurious unique violation. So you could do a unique index, create unique index concurrently and end up for a short time with two equivalent, exactly equivalent unique indexes and there's another of other, number of other possibilities. But then if that happens, 
this will figure out both of them. You'll use both of them. Of course, usually that won't happen, but if it does happen, um, you know, you certainly don't want to have uh, errors in production all of a sudden. So um, again, easy to use correctly. Okay. This is a partial index example. Um, it's, um, it's a similar example. So you're showing two, I'm just showing two arbiter indexes here. Um, okay. I'm going to talk a bit more about advanced features of inference. Um, I haven't said so yet, but this also supports expression indexes. Uh, Postgres will allow you to create indexes, including unique indexes, on arbitrary uh, expressions. For example, you could use you could do that to create a lower column name uh, expression index. So everything in the index would be lowercase, and if it was a unique index, then you'd be there you'd thereby be enforcing uniqueness over you know lowercase versions. So you'd um, you'd thereby avoid not recognizing, uh, well, you would recognize as equivalent um, cases where the only differences were in the case of uh, the, the text you were inserting. So I mentioned it's forgiving of ordering redundancy. Um, predicate works on unique indexes that satisfy it, as we say. Um, so you could still have a non-partial unique index, and if it happened to be, if it happened to sat be satisfied, or it happened to satisfy the inference specification in every other way, it would work fine because, you know, it would, it would cover everything, which is sufficient. It doesn't have, it doesn't just cover some subset that you spell out. It covers everything, so that's good too. Um, again, if you added a partial index, if you're doing a migration in production, you have both at the same time for a little while, it would just work. Um, so inference should be used in preference to, as I said earlier, um, the on conflict unconstrained constraint name variant. That's really a, kind of an escape hatch. We don't we don't recommend you use that. Um, and I says, as I mentioned earlier, exclusion constraints require it because there's no way of inferring an exclusion constraint. You have to spell out exactly which one you mean. Um, but in general, best avoid doing that. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little about other advanced features. Um, so Postgres foreign data wrapper. Who knows what Postgres foreign data wrapper is? OK, I guess like half of people. For those of you who don't know, it's a way of, it's an extension that Postgres offers that allows you to um, create foreign tables that more or less appear as tables in your local PostgreSQL instance, but in fact are maintained by another PostgreSQL instance that you connect to. So it's creating the illusion of having those be local tables um, with um, a high degree of accuracy. Um, so this will itself work with, um, with upsert, but it will it'll only support the do-nothing variant. And actually, that's simply because you are required to spell out what you mean, what constraint you have in mind when you use the do update, upsert. Um, so because foreign tables in general have no concept of a constraint, um, that, that for that reason alone, it does not yet work with Postgres foreign data wrapper. Um, so, but the do nothing variant, when you don't ask for a specific constraint, when you don't require that it be limited to that, um, when it's everything, which is probably the common case with do nothing, um, then that will work just fine with Postgres foreign data wrapper. Um, anyone heard much about ORLS, the row level security feature? Also a new to 9.5 feature. Is that something? Okay. Can I get a show of hands for that, perhaps? Okay, so people, people know about that in about the same proportion. So this is a way of, so the existing permission system in Postgres um, is basically column orientated or table orientated, where you have permissions on on columns. Um, can can I can I see the data? Can I update the data, etc.? 
um, ORLS um, basically um, offers a similar, although somewhat different capability with row, um, at the row level where you can also limit what, which rows are updated. So um, this is something that is a, a major item in the 9.5 release, um, which this will also play nice with more or less transparently. Um, there are some, there is a little special consideration to how this must work with RLS, but not too much. Um, so th it's nice that we were able to offer those both at the same time. They work very well with each other. Uh, updatable views, which are, um, as the name suggests, a way of defining a view and having an update on that view automatically be rewritten such that it updates the underlying reference table. If, it can, if the system can determine that it's equivalent to such an update, that can happen transparently. Also, will work just fine here. Library? Um, if you just install PostgreSQL 9.5, it's, it's part of the core release. There's no, it's not a library as such. Um, no, no, it's, it's, um, it's part of the core system. It basically works by, typically what you do is you have a column that has the name of the user connecting to the database, although it doesn't have to work that way. And you create a policy on the table, and that forces any query against that table to have sort of an extra bit on the predicate, potentially limiting what it can see or what it can update. It could be that an update is not allowed to see rows. It could also be that upon attempting to, it throws an error. There's a lot of complexity and variation there, depending on exact requirements. Um, you could, you know, the, the possibilities are, 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 significant, are, are considerable, uh, but basically, um, yeah, it's part of core distribution. Okay, um, logical decoding is a, is a big um, feature in Postgres uh, 9.4. It's a way that we can do uh, logical replication. A logical decoding plugin can potentially support, um, you know, for any arbitrary purpose, it can produce, um, it can consume rather logical change set records that could be used for any number of purposes. Um, the way this is will, be, will be reported, if you do an upsert, it'll be reported reliably as an insert or an update to the row. It's not, it's not possible to reconstruct that it was uh, an upsert. So it, it looks like inserts and updates if you are consuming these change set records from your plugin. Um, it might matter that um, you're not able to reconstruct, but probably not. Certainly not for logical replication. Um, so what you didn't see also is that um, the on conflict do update statement, the syntax, is totally unrestricted in its structure. Merge won't allow you to put subselects in any of the handler clauses that it has, whereas this has virtually no restrictions at all. You can, for example, have subqueries in the update. Um, it could be correlated subqueries. They may, they may reference the excluded pseudo table, et cetera, et cetera. So it's really very flexible in terms of what you can, you know, um, well, in terms of what you can, can throw in there. Um, there's uh, an awful lot of flexibility there over and above what, um, yes, sir? Um, yeah, I mean, if you, you could, you could certainly, you're certainly not restricted in that you must use the values um, statement, you could, for example, insert into whatever on conflict to update, and then you could do select star whatever. So you can select an arbitrary thing. I mean, in general, you can select an arbitrary number of rows to insert, and so it follows that you can select an arbitrary number of rows to insert or update, because that's just an extra clause on, on insert, right? Well, that's one possibility, certainly, yes, yes. Um, there's also a new 9.5 feature. Um, it's a, a 
uh, it'll let you, for uh, updates in general, are now now support um, updating multiple columns from a subselect. So in other words, you could do um, update table set in parentheses ABC equals select one two three from some other table. So you've got a subselect with multiple columns updating multiple columns all at once, as opposed to, for example, having multiple such subselects, which is messy. Um, so that can all be combined into one nice little one. This will, of course, work just as well with insert on conflict to update. Um, so that's pretty good. Um, there's also, some of you will know that in general, insert or update statements in Postgres support a non-standard returning syntax, although in fact Oracle has a similar syntax. This allows you to, this allows you to show rows after they were inserted, updated, or uh, before they were deleted, in the case of delete. So you can, you can insert something and then you can see what you actually inserted. Why would you want to do that? Well, maybe you have, for example, a serial, you know, an auto increment uh, uh, sequence, um, and it's not, you can't really determine ahead of time what the primary key value will be. Well, that'll be right there. If you do return, you can, you know, get that back immediately. This will work with an insert on conflict do update statement. Um, the same with inserted rows, of course. But with updated rows, it'll show you those um, as well. So you can see inserted or updated rows returned to the client as if they were selected more or less. Um, so again, no reason why that ought not to just work, which it does. I guess we spent some time discussing whether or not we should show the updated uh, rows as well. And the decision was that you ought to, and so you do. Okay. <clears throat> um, so because of that, you can, does anyone know what a writable CTE is in Postgres, like a with statement? Okay, so that's just, um, some of you will, will, will perhaps know that in other systems, there's always been, or as sometime there was an ability to have what is essentially like a temporary table that exists for the duration of a, of a statement. So you do a uh, with something as, and then you define, um, it could be, you know, it's another, it's another statement selecting something from something else. And then for, there, there's a, a main statement that appears underneath that that can reference the CTE as if it were a table. Um, this is a nice way of breaking up the, lo the logic of certain complicated things by sort of pipelining them. Um, so anyway, returning, which I mentioned just now, can work with this in Postgres, which is you know a unique Postgres thing. It's not in any of the other systems that do have um, with uh, statements. So you can pipeline things you're inserting and updating across CTs as well. Um, so again, immense, immense flexibility, um, very useful for data integration. Um, I'm really um, looking forward to seeing how people use it. Okay. Um, partitioning. Uh, mostly works as before. That's not um, significantly different. Um, probably not going to specifically note that. I guess that that's all I have to say on the subject. Um, unless there's any questions. Any further questions? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I always get that question. Uh, uh, um, which is. Um, the answer I, is, is no, but let me just explain why that is. Um, basically, if you do an upsert, what if, you, so let's suppose, you, suppose that did work, suppose that was offered. What would happen if both were violated at the same time? That's, that's where you get the, com the complexity of that, you know? If they were both violated at the same time, then um, you can't really do both alternative actions at the same time, right? Um, now, it is true, as I mentioned, that you can technically 
although it's not really intended to be used in a fancy way, you can technically use two at the same, two unique indexes as arbiters at the same time, but only if they're more or less equivalent in the event of migration, that kind of thing. 